welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we'd like to share with you another member of your family of saints, St. Peregrine. When cancer strikes your home or your family, a bolt of fear shoots through your entire body. There is a sense of helplessness that soon becomes hopelessness. You pray it isn't true. Your prayers go from, please, Lord, don't let it be malignant, to please let them get it all out, to please let the chemotherapy work, to please don't let him suffer. This monster strikes so rapidly, so brutally, it takes a healthy, virile, alive loved one and reduces him or her to a skeleton before your eyes. Your final prayer in futile resignation is, Lord, take away the anger I feel. We read a book about Father Damien, heroic priest of Molokai in the Hawaiian Islands. Someday he will surely be known as the saint of lepers, we thought. Leprosy, a word that struck terror in the hearts of all who heard it, was not really a threat in our country or in our time. Little did we know when we read that book there would be a new leprosy, cancer. Although heart disease is the number one killer in the United States, Somehow the C word, the diagnosis cancer, has the ability of rousing more fear and less hope. The roster of victims who have fallen to this enemy cancer have grown over the years with our own beloved parents joining in the ranks. It's consoling to know there is someone in heaven to whom we can pray, to intercede with our Lord Jesus when we need a miracle. Italy and Italians have never been moderate in anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what we mean, watch two Italians arguing on a street corner. You think they're going to kill each other. Voices are raised, arms are swinging expressively, up and down, flying in the air, never touching one another. Then their discussion over, they walk away still talking, still friends to share a cup of cappuccino or a shave at the local barber. It is a way of life to be passionate and noisy, to argue and make up and sometimes, but not often, to not make up. We are in Italy. It's the 13th century. This era was pervaded by the privileged and the underprivileged. And who was who was according to your perspective. Those who had never had enough. Needing to blame someone, they blamed the Pope. The Pope of that time was more like a king. He had lots. Lots of political power, lots of land, lots of wealth, lots of everything. The upper class wanted what he had. When words did not work, and they had to use strong means, well, so be it. Conditions deteriorated to such violence the papacy was forced to flee for its life, from Rome to Perugia near Assisi and then to Avignon. For Lee of yesterday and today has always been a fairly large city, an ancient city, it has also been a proud city. Located near Bologna, where some of the finest and first universities began in Europe, it inherited much of this city's fame and, and intelligentsia. But sadly, with these bedfellows, friend pride often sneaks in, and with it, superiority and disobedience not far behind. This was the climate of Italy, her big cities in general, and for Lee in particular, at the time of our saint. Italy of the 13th century was called Europe's hotbed of creative genius political rival rivalry and religious renewal. It was 1260. A future saint was to be born into this strange and contradictory time and climate. The well-to-do Laziosi family were actively involved in affairs of state, but more important than all the squabbling over who owns what was the little boy being born. Did they know what, what, what they were doing when they named him Peregrine, Pellegrino in Italian, or Pilgrim? We think not. By 1283, Peregrine had grown up in the narrow, self-centered world of the upper class, in an oasis of wanting and getting. No was not a part of his vocabulary, especially when it pertained to something he wanted or he chose not to do. It was a difficult time for Pope Martin IV. <clears throat> he censured the Diocese of Forli. Because of the open anarchy, priests were not allowed to administer the sacraments to the, and the faithful were denied receiving them. It forbids celebration of all design, uh, divine services, including the Mass, punishing the clergy and the laity. 
only the hearing of sermons was allowed. Although this did not constitute excommunication, an interdict such as this was only issued under grave situations, usually as a result of scandal against our religion. It was a time of hard heads and hard hearts. Things went from bad to worse. The people of Forli countered the Pope's actions with anti-clerical actions to even the score. It became so critical, the Pope sent a mediator, future Saint Philip Benizzi, to try to move the hearts of the warring citizens of Forli. Saint Philip came. He delivered an impassioned plea calling for peace and reconciliation. A group of young rowdies answered for the entire mob. They made fun of him, they jeered, they mocked his every word. They ridiculed him to the point some of the older people were embarrassed. When they could not provoke him into answering them, they pulled him down roughly from the pulpit and they pushed him, shoved him, manhandled him mercilessly until they ran him out of town. One of these rowdies was Peregrine. He belonged to the same political party as his parents. For Lee was definitely anti-papal. His parents were anti-papal, and so naturally Peregrine was anti-papal. He was cocky, sure of himself, as only the young can be. Mm. He knew exactly what he wanted out of life and how to get it. Sounds like a 13th century Paul before he converted, doesn't he? Peregrine was 18 years old. He was a man. He'd outdo the rest of his friends. He was bolder than the rest of them. He struck St. Philip on the face. Now, St. Philip Benizzi was known to have an Italian trigger temper. His reputation for having lost it many times as a youth was not a well-kept secret. However, he just stood there and offered Peregrine his other cheek. No sooner had Peregrine struck St. Philip than he could feel the pangs of guilt and remorse. He ran after St. Philip. He begged his and the Lord's forgiveness. St. Philip's action had brought about immediate repentance in Peregrine. St. Philip opened his arms and forgave him, absolving him not only of this sin, but others he had committed. As if he had showered and removed layers of skin, Peregrine felt like a new creation. The Lord had touched him, and he would never be the same. He began to find it difficult to associate with old friends. Their coarse ways and language repulsed him. What had been normal was now unacceptable. He wanted to cover their mouths before they could again use the name of the Lord abusively. The pain he felt when they blasphemed. It was more than he could bear. They weren't funny anymore. It was as if he had never known them. Peregrine was confused. As he and his friends had been persecuting St. Philip Benizzi, he had been praying for them, his persecutors. Maybe he would find his answers in church. Turning completely away from his old life and old friends, Peregrine began to spend more and more time praying in the cathedral. Hours on his knees, his eyes riveted on the beautiful statue of Our Lady in her chapel. Peregrine, our boy becoming man, was falling in love. He didn't understand it at first, he just couldn't stay away. While praying at her chapel one day, in the Church of the Holy Cross, Our Lady appeared to him. He had been praying to her for wisdom, how to know the will of her son, and upon knowing it, how to go about obeying it. She said, my son, go to Siena. Seek out my servants. Among them, you will be able to close yourself off from the rest of the world and do penance for your sins. Peregrine was hopelessly passionately in love with Mary. He could refuse her nothing. It is impossible to describe his feelings. Many who have seen our mother have tried, but there's just no way. Possibly this excerpt from Sirach might to some extent explain Peregrine's emotions. When I was young and innocent, I sought her. She came to me in her beauty, and until the end, I will cultivate her. As the blossoms yielded to ripening grapes, the heart's joy, my feet keep to the level path because from earliest youth I was familiar with her. I became resolutely devoted to her. The good I persistently strove for, I burned with desire for her never turning back. I became preoccupied with her, never weary of extolling her. 
For her I purified even the soles of my feet. In cleanness I attained her. I gained understanding with her, but I will never forsake her. My whole being was stirred as I learned about her. Therefore I have made her my prized possession. Submit your neck to her yoke that your mind may accept her teaching, for she is close to those who seek her, and one who is earnest finds her. Was it so for Peregrine? Here is Peregrine, young, passionate, with emotions he doesn't know what to do with, confused, being pulled from one direction to the other, and then the most beautiful, most perfect lady who has ever been born is there for him before his very eyes. No matter what the cost, he said yes. Mary sent an angel to accompany him to Siena. Peregrine put his house in order. Leaving no loose ends, he set out for a new life, and with him, his lady. The light that would guide him through the dark nights he would walk for years to come. As he approached the city of Siena, he must have felt that catch in his throat that we've always felt when we spot the ancient towers and majestic dome that looms up in the Siena of contrasts and contradictions, land of saints and miracles and Etruscan mystery, land of spirituality and sophistication. As he walked up the cobblestoned hills of Siena, did he feel the excitement of the new tomorrows Mother Mary had prepared for him? He rang the house of servants of Mary, or as they are also known, the Servites. Did you want to run it at the last minute, Peregrine? You must have thought, was it Mary, or had it all been my imagination? That bell made such a loud sound. A heavy door opened. The face that peered out from the long black habit was serious but friendly. Wasting no time, Peregrine was bought before the prior general. What do you think Peregrine saw as he looked up from his bowed head but the very man whom he had slapped, St. Philip Benetzi? That moment when St. Philip had withheld his temper, could he have known that this <coughs> one act would result in the conversion of a soul and the gift of that soul to the church? He accepted Peregrine into the order with much joy and thanksgiving, our Lord's word coming to life before his eyes. This son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. Peregrine entered the order around 1290 as a choir brother. He was born a radical and he would die a radical. He did nothing halfway. He now loved passionately what he'd hated passionately. He adored this God and church he'd so hated. He loved the poor people he'd held in disdain. With the same conviction and determination that he defied the Lord and his church, he now defended and obeyed them. A latter-day St. Paul running the good race, not stopping for anything until his goal was reached, Peregrine never rested. But also like with St. Paul, with this other zealot, the race was never done. They say once he received his habit, he did not allow anything to get in his way. He truly, untiringly lived as he spoke. One must never rest in the way of virtue. It is sad, said that he never sat for 30 years, mm. but he did take whatever free time available to observe silence and solitude, his wonderful time alone with his Lord and his Lady. After approximately five years, his superior sent Peregrine, now a priest, back to Forli to open a house there. He was available to everyone who called on him, never too tired to counsel whoever came to him. Because of this, he earned the name Angel of Good Counsel. An authentic and outstanding priest, he approached all the works of his vocations as gifts and privileges. His life was salvation of souls and consolation to the suffering and impoverished. As he celebrated the sacrifice of the Mass, he began reverently with the Word and then went on passionately to relive the Eucharistic prayer. He was back in Capernaum with Jesus as he is telling his followers he will give them bread and they will never die. He is in the upper room with Jesus as he is giving the means by which we can have him 
until the end of the world and Peregrine is saying yes. Yes to being that means through which Jesus would be brought to life to the faithful of his day. We know Peregrine was a zealot, but he was first and foremost a servant of God. Jesus said, feed my lambs, and that Peregrine did with the last ounce of strength. The same qualities he had shown as a brash young man fighting against the church, he now used fighting for that church's people. He ministered tirelessly to the sick. A plague broke out in Italy and spread to Forli. No one was safe or excused from the spreading ravages of the disease. Peregrine would not even take time out to be sick. Now a very tired and sick 60 years old, he could barely stand. A cancerous growth on his right leg had spread dangerously and there was no way out. He had to be operated on. He had worked among the sick in ignoring his own pain and the seriousness of his illness for years. Now it seemed the Lord was saying through the doctors there was nothing that could be done. The leg had to be amputated. Or was that the Lord talking? All his life, his greatest struggle had been obedience. That was the room of his heart he would have to hand over to Jesus again and again. No sooner did he allow the Lord into that part of his will, he would, at the next crisis, shut him out again. He always judged himself the reluctant giver. But the Lord really doesn't care how you do it. He loves reluctant and willing the same. The Lord was waiting for his total surrender. Peregrine turned the entire matter over to Jesus, but it wouldn't hurt to pray. <laughs> if the next day when he awakened from the operation, he was to be in the presence of Jesus and Mary in his heavenly home, what better way to prepare for the journey? They would not reject him as even those he'd helped had. The sight of his sore and the stench emanating from it had repulsed him. Did he surrender all those hurts over to the Lord and his mother? The night before he was scheduled to be operated on, he went into the chapter room of the priory. He was all alone. He prayed before a fresco of Jesus crucified. He fell into a deep sleep. He had a vision of the Lord. Our Lord came down from his cross and reaching out to his cancerous leg, he touched it ever so gently with his healing hand. The next morning he awakened resigned to the operation. Like with so many of us, the Lord had just been waiting for his yes. Peregrine was amazed. His leg didn't hurt. He could stand. He could walk. There was no pain. He was completely healed. The operation never took place. When the surgeons investigated the leg, they reported there was not a trace of the illness. Tell an Italian and you tell the world. News of this miracle spread. People who knew and loved him had been following anxiously the progressive deterioration of his health. Imagine when they heard he had been completely cured and overnight. Peregrine lived for another 20 years. People continued to come for him for help. Before it had been spiritual direction and healing of the soul. Now they came seeking miracles of body as well. Like with his Lord, he didn't care why they came. He said yes. There were miracles even before his death. As we say in Lourdes, no one went away disappointed. Many were healed of the cancer that attacked their bodies. But we are sure as many, if not more, left cured of that cancer that spreads and kills the soul. Through the sacrament he so lovingly administered, that of reconciliation, they went away with new life, remembering that Jesus first said, before healing physically, your sins are forgiven you. Imagine the next 20 years for Peregrine in the confessional. It had to be the culmination of this faithful priest's life. Peregrine was 80 years old, but when he looked upon his lady, it was like the first time mm. he was young. The young cavalier in the old priest's body was ready to ride gallantly forth with his lady. On May 1st, 1345, consumed now by fever, with his last spark of life, Peregrine's spirit soared like a rocket of fire to his lord and the lady he so loved. 
she had called him from the world to life as a religious. Now Mary was calling him out of the world to live eternally with her and his son Jesus. All his life as a religious had been a preparation for this, his entrance into eternal life. We know as Peregrine called out, Jesus, Mary, they lifted him and carried him home. The faithful filed by for days. Their saint was dead. So many continued to come, they left the gates of the city unlocked at night. This was unheard of because of the danger of neighbors invading. They came, those he had loved and helped, those he had visited and served, first the poor, then the sick. They testified how he had been an instrument by his example as well as by his words. Testimony after testimony came forth from the faithful who had come to witness to St. Peregrine's sanctity. A delightful aroma of flowers from the body of St. Peregrine filled the church. People said they could smell a fragrance of flowers unknown to them, strong but not sickening, delightful. Days passed. They had to say goodbye to their old friend. The servants of Mary placed the body of St. Peregrine in a coffin, but they couldn't place it in the cemetery. The fragrance continued, then the body showed no signs of decomposition. They kept it above ground in the chapel of Our Lady of Sorrows, next to the lady he had loved for over 60 years of his life. He remained there until 1639. They wanted to canonize him immediately. In many parts of Europe, the people proclaimed a holy person a saint long before they were added to the calendar of saints. The faithful brought evidence of the multitudes of miracles through Peregrine's intercession. News spread rapidly of the saint of Forli. Devotion to the saint began long before he was canonized. As early as 1350, a fresco was painted by the school of Lorenzetti in far off Siena. In Italy and to the four corners of Europe, devotion to this holy saint began. Miracles through the intercession of St. Peregrine were being proclaimed from almost every corner of the earth. Something interesting happened at the Servite Church in Barcelona. Pilgrims gathered from all parts of Spain in, to honor, to petition St. Peregrine to intercede for them. The sick would receive three hosts. On the first host was imprinted the words, Christ is born. On the second, Christ has died. And on the third, Christ is risen. Through this, the priest was telling the sick that Jesus in the Eucharist is alive and Jesus in the Eucharist is the healer. St. Peregrine and all those known to have the gift of healing go through Jesus Christ. And here in this church in Spain, Jesus tells us again, I am in your church. Come to me, all you who are weary. So many miracles were reported after his death, they stopped recording them after a while. Over 300 miracles occurred before he was canonized. Pope Pius V in the 16th century approved praying to Peregrine for his intercession and declared him a blessed. His cause was brought to Rome. All historical testimony of his life as a religious and miracles attributed to his intercession were examined by the sacred congregation of rites. These affidavits were carefully scrutinized under the supervision of such as St. Robert Bellarmine, who was then a cardinal and a Jesuit. In response to the investigation of the Sacred Congregation in 1609, Pope Paul V issued a papal bull officially approving devotion and veneration of Peregrine, allowing the use blessed before his name. His name was added to the Roman calendar of saints with permission to celebrate Holy Mass in his honor, May 1st of every year. May 1st in Italy is the feast day of St. Peregrine. A beautiful chapel was added to the church in honor of the new blessed. On the 15th of June in 1626, the first stone was laid. On May 16th, 1639, the body of blessed Peregrine was solemnly processed from the cathedral to the church where he still is today. They began in the chapel of the Blessed Mother where she had first appeared to Peregrine. 
directing him to a new life in her son through her. His urn was placed in this new chapel which had been made so lovingly in his honor. The process of sanctification of Peregrine began in the 17th century. On the 27th of December, 1726, Mother Church officially added Blessed Peregrine to the communion of saints. Pope Benedict XIII on the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica declared the church had a new saint for all ages, St. Peregrine. 300 years after his death, when they investigated his remains, they discovered his body had never decomposed. At that time, they placed him in a glass urn so the faithful could view his body when they venerated him. He was then placed above the altar in that side chapel that had been constructed when he was beatified. This has been a place of pilgrimage for most of Europe since that time, but now for Americans who have become aware he is there. The church is around the corner from a large hospital. Could it be the saint arranged this so the suffering, the ill, and their families could still come to him for hope? Father Brighetti, the custodian of the shrine, told us although most of his body, over 500 years old, was now little more than a skeleton, the leg that our Lord miraculously cured was still completely intact with flesh on it. We went up to the coffin, placed our hands on the glass, and we prayed. Like all the priests in Europe, Father became a very dear friend. It was plain he loved his saint. He gave us a tour of the church, meticulously explaining in the strong dialect of the region, the history of the saint and the church, which has been preserved in his honor. We didn't want to go, and our priest didn't want us to go. As we were walking down the street from the shrine, it seemed we had left our priest crying. And then before we could round the corner, he caught up with us. He had a book containing all the Servite missions in the world. He pointed out the ones in the United States. As the priest left us, he was wiping his eyes. He had been crying. Dear Father Brighetti, maybe you were crying because you thought we wouldn't return. Well, little did we and you know we would return. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.